Uh, I, I do think it's really important to take a step back. Uh, number one, uh, it's pretty commonplace to, for, a, for an outgoing chair to say that they will leave if and when mm -hmm. uh, somebody is confirmed for that role so that, that there is a smooth transition uh, there. And when Congress wants to act quickly, uh, they can act very quickly and confirm uh, one of a, a qualified nominee. So it should not take that long if Senate Republicans cooperate. Uh, number two, I think it's important to remember that the FDIC is an extraordinarily important agency in all of this. I remember when I was in the White House uh, last February during the Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. uh, situation, the FDIC was critical in making sure that that uh, issue didn't spiral out into a much larger problem with the banking system and played a big role in containing that. So it's important that we get somebody into that role mm -hmm. uh, who's experienced and who has a, a strong hand on the till when it comes to financial regulation. Yeah, you, would, you wonder who would want this job. If you read that report, the current state of... Uh, the culture, the workplace culture alone in this agency is is deeply troubled. Um, this is going to require a fixer. Do you have a sense of what it would take to repair the problems at the FDIC? Yeah, look, I, I think it is going to take uh, some time when you have that type of issue at an agency which employs hundreds and hundreds of people yeah. and where there's clearly some s systemic issues. Uh, it's going to take somebody who comes in and makes it a real focus of theirs to turn those issues around. It involves sitting down with the employees, really listening to what the concerns are, putting in uh, measures that would address those concerns. Um, but it can be fixed, and I've seen it happen with other agencies that have uh, had these types of systemic problems that have really improved over the years. Well, certainly that effort, I'm sure, even now is underway, even if Marty Grunberg says he's outgoing. There also is the consideration, though, as to what might not happen if he does indeed step down or if we can't get someone else confirmed in time, which includes Basel III, capital reform for some of the biggest banks that are out there. Obviously, that is something this administration has been pushing very heavily across all of these different regulatory uh, bodies when it comes to the prudential regulators, at least. Is that realistically going to happen now that all of this is happening, or is it time to call time on the end game of Basel III. Well, look, I think that there's a number of complicating factors on, on Basel III. I think at the end of the day, there's a very strong case for higher capital standards uh, on big financial institutions, but it takes a lot of coordination across uh, agencies and, it, and these types of issues, along with what's clearly been a big pushback from the industry and from fo some folks on the Hill, is going to complicate that timeline. You know, generally speaking, not a lot gets done in Washington <laughs> a few months before the presidential election. So it wouldn't surprise me uh, if the resolution of the Basel III issue happens uh, after November. But uh, but this is another complicating factor in all of that. We started by talking about the potential for a vote here on a crypto framework bill. Is this something that needs to happen because it's going nowhere? It seems in the Senate. I'd say on crypto, there's a pretty strong case uh, for legislation that does a couple of things. Number one. Uh, really protecting consumers from the kinds of frauds and scams mm -hmm. that uh, are quite frequent uh, in this industry based on what we have seen. Uh, and number two, making sure that uh, whatever the use of these assets, they're not going to spill out into uh, a broader uh, risk to the financial system more mm -hmm. broadly. Are we giving and, enough money to the CFTC to do this right? Well, I, my concern with this bill is that it falls short on both of those measures. Really? And, uh, and that a, a good bill uh, I think would be a step forward in terms of protecting consumers in, terming, in terms of addressing any systemic risk that crypto poses. My concern is that this bill isn't that bill mm. and that um, uh, it would be good for Congress to go back to the drawing board wow. um, and, and take another crack at this. I, again, I'm, I'm in favor of doing that uh, for, for the right piece of legislation. I'm just concerned that this isn't the right approach. Uh, and I think that those concerns are reflected in the Senate. Mm. Well, what the industry will say is the concerning approach should be the approach taken by the regulator, specifically the chair of the SEC, Gary Gensler, who is instead, because there is no existing regulation written by Congress, is trying to apply securities law and basically just sue the way to authority. Can that status quo stay the same? No, again, I, I think that there's a strong case for having some kind of legislated outcome here. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have these types of new technological developments, it's, it makes sense for Congress uh, to, to, to step in and, and fill in some gaps that may exist in the current regulatory framework. They need to be very thoughtful about that. And look, I, my, my head goes back to pre-2008, where uh, the financial industry came in repeatedly from 2000 onwards and said, these rules are too onerous. Mm -hmm. We need to make it easier to do subprime lending because it's easy. we've got to get access to credit for folks. 
Uh, and Congress listened to those industry requests. And what happened was that we set the conditions for a financial crisis that put the entire economy into a recession. We just need to be very, very careful when it com comes to these types of changes to our financial system because the, the risks of getting it wrong are so large. We're spending time with Rat Ramamurti, who is working as well with the Groundwork Collaborative in addressing the tax code. I want to ask you about the 2017 tax cuts, which uh, we're hearing a lot about now, an effort to be made permanent here. You're on the other side of this argument. How do you tell Americans that they're better off with higher taxes? Well, I think it's actually quite uh, popular with, with Americans to make sure that the rich uh, and big corporations are paying more in taxes. And what the Trump tax cuts did in 2017, if you recall, number one, there was a massive and permanent uh, uh, cut to the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. And then there was a series of individual changes, like, for example, increasing the estate tax threshold, so fewer and mm -hmm. fewer people pay that, uh, increase, uh, reducing the top tax rate for people making well over $400,000 in income each year. Yeah. Those are set to expire in 2025. Yeah. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, mm -hmm. just did a report that the cost of extending all of those expiring tax cuts is $4.6 trillion. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those benefits go to higher income households. People, people have an association, point. though, with those tax cuts and a strong economy. That's I, a very difficult association. So to break. I, I would, I would, I would uh, respectfully disagree Tell me. on that. Uh, do you know that the single uh, most unpopular moment of the Donald Trump presidency uh, wasn't when uh, he was trying to go after health care? It wasn't when he was saying crazy statements about COVID. It was the week before he tried to pass the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And that's because the public really revolted against the idea that we should be spending trillions of dollars on tax cuts that primarily go to big corporations and the wealthy. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, what are you the, citing the, a poll or what? what yeah, there's a survey research. Go look at it, Gallup, and so on. Okay. He was in the low 30s when it came to his approval rating at that point in time. And so, uh, and that's one of the reasons why every single Democrat in Congress from the most liberal to the most conservative, voted happily against that piece of legislation. And so uh, now we have a chance in 2025, that's what this letter is about, uh, to, to take a fresh look at all of this, because all, a lot of those provisions are expiring in the Trump tax bill. Mm -hmm. And so rather than thinking about which ones are we going to extend, which ones do we want to uh, modify, we should be looking at the tr uh, tax code holistically and say, we need to reverse this decades-long trend that we have towards bringing in less and less revenue. Just one final data point in all of this. Before the Bush tax cuts in, uh, in the 2000s, uh, we were bringing in, the federal government, about 20% of GDP and tax revenue each year. Uh, after the Bush tax cut and the Trump tax cut, it's closer to 16%. And that reduction in revenue by itself explains why our national debt is growing. It ex and, and by the way, a lot of those benefits went to the very highest income households. So we need to reverse this trend, and 2025 is our opportunity to do that. 